Okay, so in session one, we'll be looking at general exam tips first. And as we said, we are going to be just touching on the topics that CXC says they will be presenting the exam on. So the first topic is graph work and data analysis. Then we have deformation, which involves Hooke's law, turning forces, temperature, and the gas laws. So these are the things we'll be covering in session one. Next week, we'll look at different topics. Now, included in our discussion, we'll be looking at past paper questions that fall under these topics. So we have chosen relevant questions that CXC has sent before, and they fall under each of these topics. All right, so starting with the exam tips. First one is that you are to read each question properly and fully until you fully understand what is required, all right? So do not try to answer the question until you fully understand what it is asking. Next one is that the questions come with some um, directive. So it may say state or it may say explain Make sure you know what each of these words mean. And if you want to reassure yourself, you can check the syllabus on pages 85 to 88. But just an example, if it says state, it means that you are to provide factual information in concise terms and omitting explanations. So, a question which is state, you are not to really do any explanations, just to um, briefly give the, the answer, all right? On the other hand, if, if the question says suggest, you are to offer an explanation. Normally, um, state means just one mark and suggest would normally be more than one marks. All right, so it uh, number two follows, well, number three is related to number two in that if you look at the number of marks that each question values, then it will give you an idea how much to write. So if, if you have only one mark allotted for the question, then you should write a simple answer and get to the point. Whereas if the question values three or four marks, it means that you are to give a proper explanation. Um, not necessarily that you're gonna write too much, but you must write um, clear explanations. All right, for questions that require you to work out or do a calculation, remember that you must always state your formula first and then substitute values in the formula. And finally, your answer to the correct significant figures and units. So CXC will give you marks for these steps. All right, if you, if you write the formula, correct formula, you get one mark. If you substitute the values in the formula, you get another mark and the answer with the correct units. And sometimes the significant figure matters. So you get a mark for that. All right, so you want to try maximizing all the marks that you can get. Don't leave out the formula. All right, even if the question is one mark, still write the formula. All right, another tip. 
and this is coming from a past student who received a distinction in physics. And he says, close your eyes and try to visualize things. And this works well for topics such as magnetism. So sometimes the question may be abstract. You can just um, try to visualize what it is asking. All right, last tip. So question one normally is, well, question one is the first, of course, but uh, if you come across questions which are, you know, not so comfortable to you, then I would suggest you do questions which you can manage. So if question five is easier to you, do question five first, because what it does is to give you more time. You will be finished with question five because you know what to do on question five. So you will be finished with it quickly rather than to do question two, which will take you some amount of thinking and maybe you waste your time doing question two and you're not gonna get enough marks on question two, whereas you would have got um, full marks on question five. So it doesn't really matter which one you do first. Um, and apart from question one, I do question one first and then any other questions that you are comfortable with, you do them. And the, la the ones that are hardest, you do the, those last. All right, so we're gonna get into the topics. Um, Miss Rose, you can do the, um, the general concepts and then I pick up from that. You want to go ahead? All right, sure. You want to so the first, yeah, you can continue. Okay. All right. So the first question that is on the paper two is always a data analysis question, which means that you will be required to draw a graph. You have to plot a graph from some information that they give you. And of course, it means that you should be comfortable in looking at information from tabulated data usually and using the information that they give you to plot and draw a graph as well as to calculate the gradient and also to make other interpretations about the graph. So basically the stipulation from CXC is that for graph work and data analysis, you should be able to predict, hypothesize, interpret and evaluate scientific evidence, which means that if you get some information, experimental data, you should be able to use it along with the graph to make predictions, to create a hypothesis. You should also be able to look at the information or the graph that you have plotted and make interpretations or deductions from what you have. Now, as we mentioned earlier, it is important for you to be confident in graph plotting. So they also stipulate that you should be able to plot a set of values accurately on graph paper. Now, the key thing to note is that they will typically tell you what quantities to plot against each other. The first variable that is mentioned always goes on the y-axis. So if they say to plot a graph of temperature against time, the temperature goes on the y-axis, which is the vertical axis. And the time will go on the x-axis, which is the horizontal axis. Now the graph should take up as much of the paper as possible, you will be provided with graph paper. You should try to use at least two thirds of the paper. Because we we'll, CXC tends to award marks for how so you know, their decimal equivalents, etc. Those are easier to use than to use 
a scale of say one to four or one to three, all right? You also should ensure that you label your axes correctly with the quantities and the units. And once you have that, you basically maybe have maybe as much as half of the graph marks or maybe even more. Now you should also be able to draw a line of best fit once you have plotted the points and also to calculate the gradient using the formula. Right. Another thing that CXC wishes for you to be able to do, of course, is for you to read off a value on one axis given the corresponding value on the other axis. And we call this interpolation. And you should use broken lines on the graph paper itself to show your read off values. And that should include the triangle that is used to calculate the gradient. Now, a key thing to note is that there is usually a mark allotted for the unit for the gradient. The only time that you don't have a unit for your gradient is if the units will cancel, which means that both of the variables would have the same unit. So we're going to have deformation now and focus on Hooke's law. Right. Now, deformation has to do with the change in shape of an object or a body due to the application of a force. Um, when we talk about Hooke's law, it specifically refers to the deformation of springs, wires, and rubber bands, anything that has what we call elasticity. Now, Hooke's law has to do with the relationship that exists between the extension of a spring and the corresponding force. Now, for springs, there is what we call an elastic limit. Within the elastic limit, once a force is applied to a spring, there is going to be some sort of extension or the spring is going to stretch. Once the force is removed, then the spring will return to its original length. Now, Hooke's law basically states that the extension of a spring is directly proportional to the force that is applied. So if a force, if the force that is on the spring is doubled, for instance, then you would expect the extension to also double, all right? Of course, outside of the elastic limit, then Hooke's law is not going to be obeyed because the spring is going to become permanently deformed. So we're going to be looking at force extension graphs and how we can identify regions of proportionality on these graphs, as well as using Hooke's law to solve problems relating to force and extension. So we have this question from the May, June. Um, it was coincidentally a data analysis question. So we will be using this question or the explanation for both Hooke's law or deformation as well as graph work and data analysis. So the table that will be presented shows the results that were obtained by a student who performed an experiment to investigate how the length of a spring <coughs> varies with the load of Um, Miss Rose, we, we are not hearing you right now.
Can you hear me, Mr. Ruiz? All right, sorry about that. I'm not sure what is happening. From Ms. Rose said. All right, but so this question again, this question is taken from the June, May, June 2013 paper, first question. And of course, it, all of the first questions are graph questions. So you have to prepare to be able to plot graphs properly. All right, so these are the values. And the first part of the question says plot a graph of length on the vertical axis versus load. This time they actually tell you uh, that length should go on the vertical axis. They may not tell you all the time, all right? Okay, so these values are fairly easy to plot. And if you plot such a graph, you will get results looking like this. So if you want to maximize the graph space, which is what will give you um, the mark for scale, right? you have to use a scale of one to, we're using one to one on the X axis. And uh, two to 0 0.05 on the Y axis. All right. So on the x-axis, one centimeter represents one Newton. On the y-axis, one centimeter represents 0 0.025 in terms of meters. All right, so the first point is going to be off. So this point will not be in included on the line because there seems to have been an error made by the student. So when you look at all the other points, all the other points line up except this one. So, you know, sometimes you get graphs like this. And if you find that one point is out, meaning it doesn't fall within the other points, right? Doesn't fall along the line of the other points, then the best thing to do is to leave out that point from the graph, all right? So you're not going to include this first point. It doesn't have to be the first point, but in this question, it is the first point, all right? So. Some of the key things to note when you're doing your graph, you must draw your axes. So drawing your axis, sometimes the graph paper has the axes drawn for you. If not, you are to, you are to draw the, the axes, right? Next is to label the axes with the quantity and the units. So in this case, length is on the vertical axis. So you have length in meters, L mean length and M in meters, all right? And on the horizontal axis, we have force in Newtons. Now, as you notice, I did not write out the, the, the name of the quantity because it is not necessary. All you need is the correct symbol, all right? So F for force and capital N for Newtons, all right? Oh, sorry, yes, the length should be in centimeters. All right, so there's a mistake here. All right, but nevertheless, 
um, the point of it is still the same. All right. Just that you need to get the correct um, correct units here. But you would still plot using the same scale to get um, the graph as large as possible. All right. So draw your axes. Um, label the axes with quantities and units. And uh, make sure that your pencil point is sharp, you know, very sharp because you want to draw a thin line and you also want to make neat points, all right? Points should be small and neat, all right? Your graph should have a title, okay? This one says graph showing length of a spring against load. So just a simple title is necessary. You may be marked for title, so you have to put in that. All right, so we plot the points. We're not gonna go to how to plot the graph because by now you should know how to do that. But you plot the points and then you draw your line of best fit. Again, persons should know by now how to draw the line of best fit, all right? So you want to have a line that shows least um, least squares, meaning if you have a number, if you have a point over on one side of the line, then you should have a matching point on the other side of the line, um, which then they are of the same distance, all right? So notice in here, uh, we have this point here doesn't necessarily fall on the line and this one also, but we have the other two on the other side, very close to the line. So the two that are over on this side are close to the line. And likewise, the two that are on the other side of the line are also close to the line. So you want to draw uh, your line of best fit like that, all right? So the, the points should uh, fall about the line with even scatter, all right? So if you have two points over on this side of the line, then you should have corresponding two points on this side of the line, the same distance apart from the line as the other two, all right? So what you could do is to count, count the amount of squares that the points are. So if this one is one square away, this one is one square away, that means you have two squares then make sure the points on this side also add up to two squares from the line. All right. So that is the actual graph. The other parts that are on the graph are related to the gradient. So we, we are using two places two parts on the line, which are fairly easy to read off. And we have the upper point and notice it is marked with a different symbol from the graph points. All right, so you're encouraged not to use the graph points to, to form your gradient um, triangle. So I'm using two places on the line that are not corresponding to any of the given points are in the table, all right? So you choose two parts on the line, which you know you, you will be able, easy to, to read off their values. And we have the X2 value here, which is 11.0. And then we have the Y2 value here, which is 0 0.53. So what you do is based on your read off lines, you have, this is the X value here, that's 
and over corresponding um, point on the y axis now would be your 0 0.53. That's your y2 value. Likewise, your x1 value is this here, 3.0. And your y, y1 value is 0 0.32. So that's here. So you mark these on the graph so that you can easily go back and check what they are. All right. Okay, so we're going to look at the next part of the question. So determine the gradient of the graph. And this is four marks. Now, the first thing you do is to write your uh, formula for the gradient, which is y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1. Remember, we had marked those up on the graph itself, right? Then we put in our values, same values that we placed on the graph. We're going to use them. So you substitute in your values now, right? And so you're getting a mark for each step here, maybe two marks for one of the steps. Your final answer will be about 0 0.026. And notice the unit is centimeter per Newton. Centimeter was the unit for the length. And Newton was the unit for the force, the load. And so it becomes centimeter the gradient the unit becomes centimeter per newton all right if you leave this off you may lose a mark all right they want to see that you understand how the gradient and the unit are determined all right so you must have your unit all right next part of the question what information about the spring does the gradient provide? All right, so you could have said maybe either of, either of these two is telling you the, the length, the change in length that is per unit force. So remember, you are, you are plotting length. And as, you, as the graph goes up, you know, the length is changing. So it's changing length per unit force. And the change in length would be the extension. So you could also say extension per unit force. All right. All right. So um, Christopher, um, you're saying we're breaking up. All right, weird. You want to just give me an idea weird? What's the last thing you heard properly? Christopher, are you hearing me? All right, so, you know, we will have some internet challenges, guys. So if you're not hearing clearly, you can just indicate so that it can be repeated. All right, so. This is the answer for part C. Yes, Mikhail. Is there a in the that I'm not hearing, sir? What's the last thing you heard clearly? Sir, at when you read Christian or Christian C. Um, see if you can type it because I'm I'm also not hearing you properly. Just type it in the chat.
All right, question C. Okay, so this question you're referring to. What I'm saying is that the gradient is giving you or is telling you the change in length per unit force. And the change in length is really the extension of the spring. So the extension per unit force. So what I'm saying is that either of these two would be your answer. It's just one mark. So they are just looking for a simple answer. All right. Is that clear? Yes, sir. All right. Okay. All right. So next part now. All right, so use the graph to find the original length of the spring. This is two marks. Now, what the question is really asking is when there is no force on the spring, what is the length of the, uh, the spring? So you, you have to go to your graph and read the y-intercept, all right? where the graph line cuts the y-axis, all right? So we can go back to the graph so that you can see if you don't remember. Um, so let's just go back to the graph. All right, so right here. So the force is zero here, and that gives you the length, all right? Zero, no force is applied here. So this means that the value here should be the original length, all right? Now, the thing about it is that in a question like this, it depends on how you draw your graph. So you may likely get the answer correct, even if you didn't draw the line of this. All right. So what does what your graph shows is what you should read off. All right. So my graph is showing this here is about 0 0.24 or 0 0.23. All right. So the answer is 0 0.24, all right? So as the original length of the spring, 0 0.24, and that's centimeters. All right, next question. Our next, this is the next part of the question. Use the gradient to calculate the extension of the spring if a 0 0.7 kilogram mass hangs freely on the end. Hence, calculate the length of the spring with the mass attached. All right, so you are given that the gravitational field strength is 10 newtons per kilogram. So every kilogram or this means every kilogram has a, has a weight of 10 newtons. All right, so first of all, remember the gradient is 0 0.026, um, should be, I think, centimeters per newton, all right? So you are going to use this value now, and you are to find the weight of the, 0 0.7 kilogram mass. The first thing you do is to find the weight of the 0 0.7 kilogram mass. All right. 
This is done by multiplying 0 0.7 by this value here, 10. So remember that weight is equal to mass times the gravity. So you're going to multiply 0 0.7 times 10 which will give you seven. All right, so that's seven newtons for the weight. We are still not finished. You have a second calculation to do. So you're gonna find the extension by multiplying the gradient by the weight obtained. So multiply the 0 0.026 by the seven and you should get uh, your answer there. All right. So that gives an answer of 0 0.18 for the extension. And then you are to calculate the, or the length, sorry, when the 0 0.7 kilogram is attached. So if this is the extension, then you're going to add this extension to the original length, and that will give you the length when that, when that um, amount of mass is applied. So that gives you 0 0.42 centimeters. All right. Everybody comfortable? Uh, so I'm seeing something in the chat here. All right, Kalila, you're saying no. Okay, can you just explain what is the problem? Sir, my internet just. All right, you have internet problems. All right, from where did you? When our legacy. From where did you? So I didn't get enough part of it. Which part? Go again. Yes, sir. Sir, I, 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 I. That's the part before this? No, sir, this part. Oh, oh. All right, so let me just, I'll just go back a bit. All right, so uh, you are to, you said use the gradient to calculate the extension of the spring. If a 0 0.7 kilogram mass hangs freely from the end of the spring, all right? So the fact that it says use the gradient, you cannot use any other method, all right? You have to use the gradient. It could be done another way, but you have to use the gradient. So what I'm saying, I just rewrite my gradient, you know, and then I'm going to say the first step would be to find the weight of the 0 0.7 kilogram mass. Because remember, you did not plot kilograms on the graph. You plotted, you plotted um, weight, which is in newtons, right? So you have to convert this mass to weight, which is by multiplying 0 0.7, that is the mass, by 10, which is given here. That's the gravitational field strength. And you're going to get 7 newtons, which is the weight of this mass. All right. Next, you are going to find the extension by multiplying the gradient by the weight. All right. Because remember, the gradient is telling you the extension per unit weight. All right. 
So if the gradient is giving you the extension per unit weight, it means that if you multiply the gradient by the weight, it should give you the extension. All right. So that's what we did um, in the next step, which is here, multiplying the gradient by seven newtons. So the newtons cancel, newton cancel newton to the minus one leaving you with the centimeter the length so this is the extension all right then you are to find calculate the length of the spring with the mass so remember this is the extension and not the length as in the actual length of the spring this is the extension of the spring with that mass added so if you want to find the length now you have to add the extension to the original length all right, so the length of the spring with the mass attached would be the original length of the spring plus the extension. And that is uh, 0 0.24 plus 0 0.18. And that gives us um, 0 0.42, okay? Clear enough? 